Now I know there's more relevant movies that I could be reviewing. There's about four movies that had a wide release date that I've seen but haven't reviewed yet. But I figured I'd bump this particular movie up on the reviewing schedule because this is a first for me. This movie I saw on my iPhone because I could find an on-demand copy of it. And <laughs> this is the first time that I've watched a movie and had the urge to slam my phone down in order to stop the movie. Granted, I did not throw my phone because I don't want to break my phone. But the fact that I had that urge while watching a movie is baffling to me. I've never hated a film that much. So let's talk about the Aspern Papers. Where do I even begin with this movie? Well, I guess in my movie reviews I normally talk about the plot, but even that's a little bit of a mystery to me because this is one of those films that things aren't all that well explained and things aren't established all that well in this movie. So I'm going to give it a try because some of this is actually kind of guesswork. Now, I believe the film is set in the 1800s. I'm not actually quite sure because there's only one year that is actually shown on screen and it's not the present time of the movie. Or at least I don't think it's the present time that the movie takes place because it's during a flashback. It says 1822 and then it doesn't really say how many years passed you, you just assume a lot because the people that are young in, the, in that moment in time are now old. But I believe it's still in the 1800s, I imagine. Our main character is obsessed with a dead poet. Now, this dead poet died young. He may have committed suicide. Actually, yeah, I think he did. And this poet had a mistress who was also his muse. That's not explained all that well in the movie either. I thought it was his widow that we're seeing in the movie, but it, I guess it's not his widow at all. I had to look up the plot to find out that it was a mistress slash muse. And now our main character believes that the poet wrote this muse letters. And these letters could be of great importance and could be worth a lot of money and a lot of significance could be had with these letters. So our main character is obsessed with obtaining them. But he can't just ask her for the letters because she'll just turn them down. So he decides to deceive this widow who is living in this big mansion with her niece. He tells her that he'll pay rent, stay in one or more of the rooms of the mansion, and in return he will bloom flowers in their garden because he pretends to be obsessed with flowers and making things beautiful. You know, I'm looking for a garden. It's absurd if you like for a man, but... I can't live without flowers. There are none to speak of down there. It costs too much to cultivate them. One has to have a man. Why should I not be that man? You shall have the finest flowers in Venice. We don't know you. Oh, you know me as much as I know you. That is to say much more, as you now know my name. But then when that's not really working to his advantage, he figures his second step is to maybe seduce the niece, all for some letters from a dead poet. And that's, that's the movie. This movie made me angry watching the film. It filled me with hatred and aggravation, and it felt so pointless. But at the same time, there are some good things to be said about the film because 
I do try to look for the good in even the worst films, and I could still see some good. The sets and the camera work is decent in the film. This is a period piece, and even though we don't get to see a lot of the garden or the mansion, the rooms we do see are pretty well done. The costumes, for the most part, are good, though I will say the sun visor is very distracting in the scenes with the mistress slash muse because it just seems so out of place with her costume. It's She's wearing all black, and that all black looks like it's right for the period, but the green sun visor looks so out of place. Maybe it's just me. I don't know, but it was distracting every time she was in a scene. As far as acting goes, the two main female leads in the movie were good. Now granted, I didn't like their characters at all, and I thought their characters were poorly developed, but the acting and what they were given was good. You have Vanessa Redgrave, who is the, which I thought was the widower, but she is a mistress slash muse of the dead poet, and she looks surprisingly good for supposedly being 150 years old in this movie, or her character being 150 years old. She's good at being a no-nonsense woman, <laughs> a no-nonsense older woman that is a little bit senile and paranoid and crazy, and she has a good performance. Jolie Richardson is the niece in this movie, and I guess the main love interest of our main character. I never believe that he actually loves her because he definitely just wants to seduce her. I can't trust a single thing that the main character says, so I don't know if he really does like her or not, but I guess she's the main love interest, and she's good in the movie. She is this timid woman who seems to have lived a very sheltered life, and she has the only character development in this entire movie which makes it seem like she's the main character, but she really isn't. She should be, but... Because, again, she has the only character development in this movie. She's the only character that goes about some sort of change, where she becomes less timid and less scared of the world and less sheltered and wants to, by the end of the movie, gets out of the mansion and wants to explore. And I thought the actress did a good job at that character. And now I've run out of good things to say about the movie. So, buckle your seatbelts, let's get to the bad. Okay, so Jonathan Rhys Myers is our main character of the film. And to be honest, this is the worst thing about the film. His acting and the character he plays. Now, Jonathan Reese Myers has been in other movies that I've seen, and I, I remember liking some of his performances, but this movie is absolutely irritating. Every line delivery he has was aggravating to hear, and he just sounded like this overly dramatic villain. It was like he was playing Dracula without being Dracula. Yeah, oh, that's, that's something I saw him in. He was in that Dracula series. I liked him as a vampire. He's playing a fucking vampire in this movie without being a vampire. I'm not going to take anything from you. I have some writing to do. I would like some quiet over a period, possibly all winter. I also need a great deal of open air. I find a garden is really indispensable. Nothing will change for you all. Except, of course, the flowers. For us all. I mean all your family, however many you are. There's only one other. She's very old. Only one other? In all this place? Surely then you have space to spare. If you could let me two, three rooms, it would greatly assist me. I also did not like him as a character. His character is so unlikable, so deceptive, so overdramatically villainous that I could not believe a single thing he says in this movie. 
Now, you can have villains as main characters in movies and in books and in all sorts of things. I've seen it done very well in certain things, but in this movie, it is done poorly. There's nothing redeemable about him. The performance is bad. Everything he says is distrustworthy. It's... I could care less that he gets these fucking papers. Actually, I could care less about the papers themselves. Let's also get into the plot because the plot was mind-numbingly boring and pointless. It also doesn't help that within the first scene, you could pretty much predict what these letters are about, these supposedly secretive letters because it almost feels like this is going to be a big twist of the movie, like some big mystery. But within the first scene, I realized, oh, oh, the dead poet's gay, isn't he? Or at least he loves both men and women, one of the two. You know how I figured this out? Well, within the first scene, it shows him dying, because there's like narration of our main character talking about his death and stuff. He had been not only one of the most brilliant poets of his day, but one of the most genial men, and one of the handsomest. And there's this funeral for this dead poet uh, on the beach, and I believe it's the beach that he was found dead on, and the only ones that are, that showed up to his funeral are the mistress slash muse and this guy. And the guy seems to have taken this a lot harder because as soon as he's put to flame, this other guy just mindlessly, like a zombie, starts walking into the ocean and we never see him return. So who knows, maybe he walked out to die, maybe he came back out, I have no idea. This movie doesn't tell you. But as soon as I saw that reaction, I said, oh, this guy was in love with the poet, or maybe the poet was in love with him, vice versa. Poet's probably gay, isn't he? And sure enough, that's like the big twist in the middle of the movie. Okay. Who cares? I saw that coming. Our main character's villainous plans is overcomplicated to the point of, well, not even being comical, just annoying. The dialogue also doesn't help. Maybe this is the dialogue from the actual no novella because this was based off of a novella, back in the 1800s, 1888, I believe I looked it up. And maybe the dialogue is straight from the book, but when it's presented in this movie, it feels meaningless. It feels like the type of dialogue where people who write it are like, oh my God, this is the smartest thing I've ever written. Oh my God, this is amazing what I've done. Everyone will love it. It's like that kind of dialogue where you know that whoever wrote it thought he was brilliant. And maybe the book itself is a lot better than the movie, and maybe the book earns that dialogue, but this movie does not earn that dialogue because everything about this movie is just plain stupid. And I know this movie was set in much older times, but... No one in this movie feels like they act like real humans. It's almost like they're aliens in this movie. Like, for instance, and this is towards the end, this is more spoiler stuff, but I don't really care about spoiling this movie. Most likely you never even heard of this movie if you're watching this. Um, but the mistress slash muse woman... Vanessa Redgrave, she dies in the movie. Now, she dies because she gets overexcited, and that's because our main character, our main hero, I guess, is fed up with just waiting for these letters. So he sneaks into a room and starts searching for him. And the mistress walks into the room, sees that he's looking for these letters, and goes, You... Then she, like, has a heart attack and dies. And the niece runs in. She's like, oh, no, no, and crying. And then our main character just goes, 
I'm out of here and just runs right out of the room basically. And <laughs> the niece is clearly upset about her aunt's death, right? And the next scene is a funeral for the aunt where the niece is on a boat and they're on the river and then you see the casket and it's like, oh, so she died. Okay. And then the very next scene, she's talking to our main character like he had no, <laughs> like he was not responsible for her death whatsoever. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Shouldn't she be a little upset with him? I mean, he did get her overexcited and basically he is responsible for her death maybe indirectly, but he, he was responsible. You're not even the slightest bit mad? No? Okay. Okay, moving on then, I guess. It also doesn't help that a lot of the character backgrounds and a lot of the who these characters are is a lot of guesswork in this movie because the movie doesn't really establish its characters. It just throws you in there and then just says, oh, you didn't realize this person was actually a mistress and not actually the wife of the dead poet? Oh, well, too bad. It's not our fault for not explaining it, I guess. It honestly feels like you need to read the book in order to understand some of the things that actually happen in the movie or who these characters are and whether they should be believed or not. In the end, I actually hated this movie more than I did Norm of the North, Keys to the Kingdom. But even though I hated this movie more, I do see that there are some aspects that are at least somewhat redeemable in quality, unlike Norm of the North, Keys of the Kingdom, where there's nothing good to say about the movie. So in the end, I'm going to give the Aspern Papers half a star. It's, it's really not worth looking into. And it's, it's... I wanted to throw my phone watching this movie. So, did you see the Aspirin Papers? What did you think about it? Go ahead and comment below. And if you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe and check out my movie reviews and countdowns of this year, of previous years, of whatever. Or check out my Let's Play of Resident Evil 2, which... Hopefully after some reviews, I'm going to start doing another session because I haven't played it for a week now, and I'm anxious to keep playing. But as always, this is Bruce Gifford, and this was just my